Back in the early 2000s, when this man began his reign as the president of the largest black nation on earth, every elite in the land with some capital to spare had their eyes set on the oil wealth of the nation. The new president had declared his intention to sell off some of the country's publicly held companies and assets in order to reduce the piling debt strangling the new democracy. That decision, though it helped reduce the country's debt, also shifted the nation's wealth into the pockets of just a few. I, Olusegun Obasanjo, do solemnly swear that I will be faithful to their true allegiance to the Federal Republic of Nigeria. For example, a simple Google search of Starcrest scandal doesn't initially bring up anything interesting. Not until you look closer and you begin to see the can of worms spewing ridiculous figures all around. In this first episode of the Declassified series, we take a look at the Olusegun Obasanjo's presidency between May 1999 and May 2007 to see how the former president and his administration managed the resources of Nigeria, more so how his cronies ended up with most of Nigeria's assets, especially the oil blocks. How did this happen under the administration of a man that endeared himself to the White House through his public declaration of war on corruption? In this story of corruption as seen under Obasanjo, we will search for the loot of Obasanjo's administration to see how billions of dollars meant for the Nigerian people were diverted under Obasanjo, Nigeria's first anti-corruption crusader. The National Assembly cabal of today it's worse than any cabal. We will also uncover some of the biggest cover-ups of Obasanjo's administration. We will conclude this episode with some of the scandals that ruined Obasanjo's legacy and how those scandals have gone ahead to define Nigeria. This is declassified, a story of corruption as seen under Olusegun Obasanjo. Buckle up, it's going to be a wild ride. In 1999, when Olusegun Obasanjo became the first democratically elected president of Nigeria, hopes were very high for the civilian government he was trying to put in place. Although a former military head of state, the Nigerian people trusted Obasanjo to rule differently than the nightmare regime of General Sani Abacha. The stage was then set for an economic transformation, or so people thought. When Obasanjo began his reign, Nigeria's economy was on the highway to hell. Yeah, things were pretty horrible. Inflation had averaged about 30% a year throughout the 90s and by 2001, around 20% of Nigerians that were ready to work were without jobs. Poverty was a popular name on the street and Obasanjo's government had to resort to some extreme measures to try and salvage some things somehow. In one desperate move, the government offered to pay, and I'm not kidding, 3,500 naira a month to around 200,000 people and their jobs were to sweep the streets and do any mending work required. This project was then replaced with a national poverty eradication program which focused on generating youth employment, rural infrastructure and conservation. In 2000, Obasanjo's government then managed to double the legal minimum wage. But remember, Nigeria was a very corrupt country at the time. Well, someone says the same story today, but let's not go there. So in order to protect all of these initiatives he was rolling out and to also get in the good books of Washington, Obasanjo presented an anti-corruption bill to the National Assembly. He also constituted both the Independent Corrupt Practices Commission and the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission our good friends, the EFCC. So, wait a minute, Jude. I, I thought you wanted to like talk about corruption under this guy's administration. So, why are we licking his ass again? I mean, well, forgive me, ladies and gentlemen, and for taking too long on that, but it is about to get real. Now that we have the backstory of Obasanjo's administration, it's time we proceed with some juicy discovery for you. And the most interesting one happened in the oil sector. 
In November 2016, Obasanjo engaged the National Assembly in a war of words, where he called the National Assembly a den of corruption by a gang of unarmed robbers. The Nigerian Assembly members responded to the attack by calling the former president the grandfather of corruption in Nigeria. But why was that? How did Obasanjo contribute to corruption in the country to warrant that title? It is no longer news that Nigeria is the fifth largest exporter of crude oil in the world, but goes around to spend over $16 million per day importing refined petroleum products. This situation has been attributed to the poor refining capacity of the country. But here's something I stumbled on. Nigeria has spent over $1.6 billion on the maintenance of the country's four refineries since the year 2000. Yet, they produce absolutely nothing. So, where the hell is that money going to? This is the Wari Refinery. It was commissioned in 1979 under General Olusegun Obasanjo with an initial capacity of 100,000 barrels per day. When Obasanjo became president in 1999, the refinery operated from January to February 2000 at about 10.3% of the installed capacity and was later shut down because the main heater somehow blew up. That's, that, that was a shame, seeing that a new administration just took office, right? Well, not so fast. You see, in the year 2000, four capital projects were identified to help improve the performance of the refinery at a total cost of $220.7 million and $351.15 million naira. If the government wanted, they could just go ahead and fix the main heater that blew up. That shouldn't be an excuse for not refining oil in the country. Now, to prevent the endemic corruption in the country from gaining a foothold in the oil sector, which was like the bedrock of Nigeria's economy, President Obasanjo named himself the Minister of Petroleum and was in charge of all things NNPC. There will be no secret cow. Nobody, no matter who and where, will be allowed to get away with the breach of the law or the perpetration of corruption and evil. But this move didn't bring transparency to its operation at all. Insiders of the administration confessed to this. According to a book titled Too Good to Die, Third Term and the Myth of the Indispensable Man in Africa, the former president of Nigeria, President Olusegun Obasanjo, while serving as Minister of Petroleum Resources, never discussed activities of the corporation with government officials. This was until his last days in office. He ran NNPC as one-man business for eight years. Now, that's not so great a resume for an anti-corruption crusader, is it? According to insiders, Obasanjo was ultimately responsible for all the decisions made affecting the petroleum sector during his administration. The book further revealed how Obasanjo managed to secure approval for all his dealings as petroleum minister. During one of the last Federal Executive Council meetings, the authors wrote, precisely in May 2007, Obasanjo required the cabinet to give retrospective approval to all the measures he had taken over the eight years in which he acted as sole administrator of Nigeria's oil industry. Quote, Cabinet duly obliged him after recording Vice President Atiku Abubakar's objection. According to the author, each minister received his share of the documents they were required to approve in a Ghana must go bag, end of quote. You see, none of them had the capacity to process or read these documents, yet they approved it anyway. During his eight years in office, NNPC operations were reportedly shrouded in secrecy with little or no accountability in place. Obasanjo was said to have disregarded due process on several occasions, allegedly bypassing the National Assembly on issues of funding and failing to render proper accounts of oil revenue to relevant agencies. This played out right at the tail end of his administration. 
You see, on the 28th day of May 2007, Reuters reported that Nigerian business tycoon Aliko Dangote, who was Obasanjo's close ally and major donor, had completed the purchase of Kaduna Refinery. It was the second major refinery purchase in a week by Dangote. This was after he bought the largest refinery in Port Harcourt on May 17th of that same year. In the weeks leading up to Obasanjo's departure, Dangote's privately held company has also scooped up a cement plant, a telecoms license and mining concessions, all in a rush of unexplained privatization by the outgoing administration of Obasanjo. But Yadua, after taking over from Obasanjo, told the Financial Times in an interview that he would consider reversing the sales if they were found to have been carried out without due process. And out of the blues, Dangote and his consortium pulled out of the deals. Dangote and Co. had paid $561 million for the Portacourt refinery and $160 million for the Cardinal refinery. They sent a letter to the federal government demanding a refund of their money. But this has been a modus operandi of Obasanjo's administration. Secret deals and lots of behind closed doors arrangements. This was further highlighted by some damning information that came to the public in 2006. About a year before leaving office, there was a scandal in the oil ministry headed by Obasanjo himself. You see, this is classic irony that the very Ministry of Petroleum that the corruption-fighting President Obasanjo assigned to himself was always the one that seemed to record the greatest number of periodic scandals. According to this report, Adax Petroleum, a Swiss-based Canadian-listed company, had found a way to acquire a lucrative oil field behind closed doors. This was despite the fact that the Obasanjo's administration claimed to have an open bidding system in place. The news came into the open when Adax itself announced that it had agreed to pay $90 million to take control of oil processing license known as OPL-291, that is an oil block that was not bidded for in the open auction held in May of that year. According to Adax, it was acquiring its interest in the block from Starcrest a Nigerian company with little to no profile. No one had heard of them before that moment. When the scandal got serious, Director of the Department of Petroleum Resources, DPR, Mr. Chukweke, was fired. But the question now was, could this Mr. Chukweke have awarded an oil block to anyone without the approval of both the junior and senior ministers of Petroleum Resources? You see where this is heading? now. Who is the Minister of Petroleum Resources again? I leave that question for you to answer. Well, according to reports, some DPR top officials were quoted as saying that, quote, we were told ahead of time before the May bidding that Block 291 should not be included in the auction and that it was reserved for a maker of four. And we all know that a maker of four is the President Obasanjo's voice in this office, end of quote. This damning revelation only goes to suggest that the oil block was being reserved for the president. Now, is this true? I guess we will never know because, you know. But these secret deals didn't happen in the oil sector alone. Back in May 2007, some few days before leaving office, Obasanjo reportedly announced to the Federal Executive Council the award of contracts worth 756 billion naira. That proposal sailed through the council without much opposition. According to Frank Mweke, then Minister of Information, 70 billion naira of this would be for the resuscitation of textile industries in Nigeria, 58.6 billion naira for the second Niger bridge, its maintenance was to take 42 billion naira. But interestingly though, the companies to execute the projects were not named. Now, I will not claim to know how these contract processes are being followed by the federal government, but something doesn't sound right. As I was looking through some ridiculous spending, I found something interesting. When he was in power, Obasanjo withdrew 2.1 billion naira 
from the excess crude oil funds. This withdrawal was made in March 2006 when he explained that he wanted to use the money to supplement the cost of the extension of the national census. Now, the interesting thing was the former president had failed to inform the National Assembly or the Nigerian people for almost three months after that withdrawal was made. Basenja then wrote a letter some months later to the House of Representatives claiming $17.2 million, about 2.1 billion naira now, was withdrawn after he had convened an emergency meeting of the stakeholders, that is, some state governors and the Revenue Mobilization Allocation and Fiscal Commission members. So, we have stakeholders that decide how much is taken out of the Nigerian National Treasury. Without question, yes, we do. Now, there was an endless supply of scandals during Obasanjo's administration showing clearly how he and some close officials handled the resources of Nigeria in not so transparent fashion. I may not be able to cover everything in detail here, but here's a summary for you. Sometimes during his administration, Obasanjo accused Vice President Atiku Abubakar of corrupt enrichment. According to the EFCC documents which Obasanjo came to be in possession of, Atiku was alleged to have diverted a sum of $125 million approved for the operation of the Petroleum Technology Development Fund to an Equatorial Trust Bank owned by Otumba Mike Adenuga and Trans International Bank TIB, which thereafter gave 400 million naira to Mofas Shipping Company owned by Otumba Oyewole Fasawe. The EFCC also connected Adenuga's payment of $20 million for his Globalcom license to PTDF money lodged in his bank account. According to the documents from October 2003, Mofas paid more than 500 million naira to Omar Paria, personal assistant to the former vice president, while 61 million naira was paid by the company directly to Atiku and 60 million naira directly to Musa Gauba, a contractor who works for Atiku's American University. Atiku responded by saying that Obasanjo, his family, businesses, native community and even the People's Democratic Party benefited from the PTDF money. So he didn't deny it. He was just like saying, oh yeah, you want to accuse me of stealing the money, but you had a share of it. This is like saying, oh yeah, I agree. The diversion of funds happened, but you benefited too. Atiku further revealed that Bodunde Adeyanju, Obasanjo's personal assistant, made over 100 visits to Trans International Bank, Abuja, located at Tofa House in the Central Business District between 1999 and 2004. Garba Shehu, Atiku's spokesperson, claimed that from 1999 to the elections in 2003, Adeyanju, on behalf of Obasanjo, collected over 3 billion naira from Mofa's account at TIB, Abuja branch. Atiku further revealed to the Senate Committee on the Fund how Obasanjo paid a staggering 250 million naira of PTDF money to a lawyer to register a company known as Galaxy Backbone. Femi Falana alleged that from 1999 to 2007, Obasanjo had withdrawn over 1 trillion naira unauthorized and unappropriated by the National Assembly from the NNPC account and the Federation account. These are huge allegations that were in part investigated by the EFCC. And somehow, Obasanjo was cleared of all allegations of corruption. During his fight with Obasanjo, former Vice President Atiku Abubakar told Nigerians about a federal government program that was introduced during Obasanjo's administration. It was a program that had allocated a 50 billion naira loan to be assessed by farmers. Atiku revealed that Obasanjo's farm somehow managed to access a loan of 2 billion naira at the time to help improve its operations. The question that was being raised by Atiku was, if President Obasanjo solely took 2 billion naira loan from the 50 billion naira agricultural fund facilitated by the federal government, 
when there are millions of Nigerian farmers who should access the loan, but have been crying for access since the introduction of the loan program. So if Obasanjo collected two billion naira from a 50 billion naira fund approved by his government, does this imply conflict of interest or corruption? There were accusations of land grabbing where Obasanjo was alleged to have manipulated the law to dispossess the people of Akpa in Badagri, Lagos State for the building of Bells University. This led to a protest by the villagers who were beaten and arrested to quash this protest. Then in 2002, the former president was alleged to have acquired 250 hectares at Ajoda for tick cultivation. Obasanjo reportedly turned the people of Abela near Abelkuta against their leaders over land. And then in Cross River State, the story is not so different. In 2001, it was alleged that Obasanjo acquired 10,000 hectares from the immediate past governor, Donald Duke, for oil palm estate. Also, the retired general secured an additional 5,000 hectares at Kwa Plantation and took over the government oil palm nursery in Ochon. Now, according to a United States cable obtained by Wikileaks, the pioneer chairman of the EFCC, Malam Nuhuri Badu, allegedly described corruption under President Olusegun Obasanjo as worse than that of late General Sani Abacha. In a meeting with the former U.S. ambassador to Nigeria, Robin Sanders, Malam Ribadu told the U.S. ambassador that Obasanjo was good at covering his tracks while admitting that corruption was worse under Obasanjo. While he promised transparency and vowed to fight corruption in the country, his administration failed to do so. His decision to appoint himself to the position of petroleum resources meant there was little to no accountability from the NNBC during those eight years he was in charge. This set the precedent we have in the country today. And in all honesty, Obasanjo may have been cleared by the EFCC of all allegations of corruption, but just like the National Assembly said, he may as well be the grandfather of Nigeria's plight. We will see how that played out in his final hours as he prepared to hand over power to Yaradwa. This was after failing to continue for a third term. More on that in the next episode. Thanks for watching. This is Declassified and I will see you in the next episode.